This is Ben Gillespie interviewing Christoph Vodutko, who's currently in Maine. It is July 23rd, 2020, and this is for the Smithsonian Institution Archives of American Art Pandemic Project. Christoph, could you tell me a little bit about how 2020 has been for you and your experience of the coronavirus pandemic and the larger events that have unfolded this year? Well, <clears throat> I'm uh, feeling suspended in time and space. It seemed to be an unreal life. So I'm waiting for the return of, of the normal. At the same time, I'm not sure if I'd really wish that normal to return since there is something that feels good about this abnormality, about this exceptionality. I might return to this later because I need to refer to specific matters and situations in trying to make it clear to you. Even if I might never reach a full clarity of what exactly it is uh, that I'm might be missing once uh, the epidemic's time is over. But in any case, I feel a loss of a sense of time. The loss of a density and three-dimensionality of time. I'm speaking of the kind of time that connects with pursuing plans and practically making things, uh, not just planning things to happen, inventing new things out of the process of doing things together with others, learning from members of my team, production team, while experimenting, testing practically ideas and working close proximity with each other. So I suffer a loss of the chance to be physically part of events and experiences as well. Uh, the, the events that bring a meaning to time and are indeed a measure of time, or as one might say, through which the time and its value is being measured. So each new si significant and truly experienced event starts a new calendar in one's life. So time of making things seems gone. So for, uh, for us who are always busy, the people who are always making things, the sense of time in general seems gone. It seems too much of it, right? There is a sense of a complete lack of it. I have been thinking of this a lot, but when was it? When I was thinking about it, was it yesterday? a month ago, a week ago, two months ago, memory of time, of how much time there is left ahead and how much it's gone, that exactly what's gone with the loss of sense of time. So the loss of sense of spatial and psychological or psycho uh, social space also is the problem. So that because this is the space in between, this kind of mediation space between the people and myself, and such space in which also they, the people, are uh, separated, but also communicating through it with each other. So the people whom I meet on Zoom meetings, so the sense of space between them is gone, and the space between me and them is gone. No physical space between us. So no spatial perspective uh, on them and further perception about me or of my expressions and their expressions, bodily expressions, the language of the, of the bodily expression, that is limited. So flat portraits fixed in present time, but absent without performative dimensions as if, it, as if it's frozen in time and space. So this, two-dimensional mediatized people far away in so many ways, but also sitting so close, too close, in the private room of my personal space, speaking to me straight against my face, 
it's very confusing. So that's, that's how I feel in this situation right now. So I feel like looking uh, uh, through my little window of a uh, computer screen, I see other windows in which other people are as if they were imprisoned in a panopticon. So oh, they're watching me, I'm watching them. So this is, I don't know, there's always central tower that is watching all of us. That's another issue <laughs> because it's all recorded or not recorded and it's being visited without me knowing about this. So that central tower of Panopticon is huge. It actually is everywhere. It's not at the center, but we are actually looking at each other's window cells and appearing in each window, one next to another in a row of windows. That's pretty uh, discouraging. Your work has been so interested with the ideas of profound estrangement and communication in the past and the voices of the dispossessed. Do you, do you feel any shift in your work as you move to this new setting, this new mode of psychosociality? Um, yes, this yes. Uh, yes, you actually are uh, hitting a very important point because I do work with people. My projects are not just, as one would think, projections on monuments and buildings or, or designing some communicative instruments and equipment for people in public space. My work, actually, the core of it work, is a year, sometimes a year and a half, of, uh, of working with people uh, so they will be ready to project themselves or to communicate through the equipments with other people. So recording, re-recordings, initial contacts, conversations with people, they require, that's related to the, the process of building a trust with those people. Well, that is trust is very hard to establish through, uh, through Zoom or uh, you know, in any other communication devices. Um, there, there has to be some face-to-face -face contact, eye-to-eye -eye contact, and also, you know, a come more of a, of a situation and spatial situation that is appropriate for buildings of such trust. It could be an institution, uh, which is a, a kind of exterritorial space uh, to which those people who want to speak through my projects will come and they might feel, or there could be a studio or some professional space, but anyway, the space that uh, belongs to, or to, to the project, it, it, it doesn't belong to me or to them. Uh, so that we can kind of uh, open up towards each other. And of course, there was no limitation here, much of time. Oh, well, that's hot, tough because the uh, other thing that I mentioned before about Zoom connections, you know, applies the problems that I mentioned, they apply to this very important process of recording, re recording, and actually creating the possibility of public testimony, which is brave, honest, emotionally charged, and in which things are said that normally those people will not say you know, exactly the ones that ought to be said and communicated, the experiences and feelings of those people, whether they are homeless people or they are refugees or they are abused and neglected or, or, or uh, uh, women or uh, other members of society or people who are minorities that somehow silence and be invisible, for them to open up very difficult. Uh, it is so that so the the process of which I am speaking has psychotherapeutic aspects, and those are very hard. Uh, the conditions they require conditions that are hard to make when you are meeting those people for the first time via Zoom. So, I was thinking um, with your projects, which are so oriented towards helping people to find their voice and finding an outlet. Um, how have you observed the 
the movements we have now where there is a public finding a voice despite incredible distance um, in the Black Lives Matter protests and activism now, um, you know, that seems really tied between this, this voice of the people and voices of the dispossessed and the erosion of institutional trust and um, right. how we can find ways to work together in a new way of life. Well, I'm watching uh, the movement, the social movement and protests and what's happening around monuments, for example, and uh, in various cities, uh, just looking at the flat screen. So it's extremely frustrating for me, not being able to be part of the crowd and really understand what's happening in a more direct way, physical, bodily, uh, a tangible human way. Uh, at the same time, this isolation uh, uh, creates conditions for me to think about myself in relation to what's happening. To, uh, to have a deeper uh, a thought about my own upbringing the traces and elements of colonialism and maybe systematic racism that are inhabiting my soul. Something that maybe I brought myself from Europe when I arrived here from Poland. Because it's a global movement now, the soul searching is happening everywhere. But myself, I need to learn a lot you know, of many colleagues of mine as well, but artists included. But myself, I, even if, if I'm known for actually working and approaching and, uh, and, and learning and addressing the issues that are in part uh, now, uh, you know, connected or part of, uh, of the movement, you know, as a designer of uh, memorial, to, uh, to the abolition of slavery in Nantes, and also working with so many people of color and minorities in my projects for so many years, including refugees from Africa uh, fleeing civil wars. One of those from 70 million of displaced people right now in the world, you know, many of them are black. So also facing colonialism of, of my own country, the critical matter in some of my projects. Yes, I should think I should be fine. But in fact, this isolation and at the same time contact through the events, uh, through news, but also participating in uh, discussions at Harvard, academic uh, discussions how to uh, undo system systemic racism as a part of academia in new programs and structures of teaching and new ways of learning and new subjects to learn. I mean, it's all of this together in this isolation creates a, quite a, a challenge. It's very intense projection on myself and attempt to uh, recognize what I was not clear to me before inside of me. So in, our, in our words, we, as Michel Foucault would say, I, of course, refuse the way I became, you know, by the culture in which I grew up, by not doing certain things, not saying certain things, not only doing things wrongly, and, and uh, but also a kind of crime of omission, you know, that is part of, uh, of, uh, of my uh, practice and, and my uh, intellectual part of my work in academia. So we are rewriting uh, reading, the reading list, lists, you know, so <laughs> we're actually discovering fantastic material uh, that was somewhere neglected and not taken seriously for exactly the reason that was part of the systemic racist culture. So that's where I am in between the epidemics 
and the social movement between the virus, uh, the disease, and the cultural ills and disease, which uh, needs to be cured. So undoing is something that I do. And of course, projects that I do now, since I cannot physically be involved in experimenting and producing work, many of my projects are suspended. Uh, not clear when I will be able to work on them. I do a lot of conceptual work. I actually plan things. I put together arguments for those things to happen. Um, you know, in fact, I am shifting to some projects that I put aside because I never had time to do them. That is positive in some ways, however painful at the same time. And to, to sort of draw us towards a close, I have um, sort of a two-part question, if you'll indulge me. Um, the first part is, what do you think mourning looks like or memorialization looks like as we continue in a COVID landscape and reconciling with the histories of, um, of colonialism and slavery in the United States and systemic racism? And um, coupled with that, what is your hope for the future as we move forward? Well, it's Specifically, since I seem to be, well, I'm expected to say something about monuments because uh, I've done so much work with those monuments. Well, in fact, with living monuments, their trauma, who, uh, who choose to join me in animating <laughs> historic monuments. So in a way, teaching the past rather than learning from the past. Teaching the past from the point of view of the present. So the, the projection on the, on, the, on the past of the present or the present time on those monuments to the past in order to teach them how they should uh, think of themselves and also how we should think of ourselves in relation to the past so, and also in facing the future. What is the future we are trying to achieve? Exactly the question that you asked me. So those questions are being asked, discussed in front of the monuments, around them and also against them. They are suspects and they are witnesses to crimes that happened in the past and we wish that they will not happen in the future if we do something, well, but the dialogue with those, uh, or not, so, not only with those monuments, but the dialogue among each, uh, each of us in, in front of them or around them or against them, uh, speaking back to those monuments, that's very important. So, so, so the issue is really whether those monuments, it's not so much whether those monuments should stay or be gone, but what kind of process are we envisaging here uh, that will really uh, make a change for the future? And I feel that this process has, has to take a form of discourse, of exchange of points of view, of uh, not singing the same song. So I just hope that uh, uh, this revolutionary time will lead us towards a new culture in which we will communicate and exchange our relation to the past and the future in a kind of agonistic way, without violence and blood, of course. Well, so that means that there is some work for everybody, including artists and designers, and I don't want to now discuss any specific projects. It's too early for it. Of course, I'm, I'm elaborating here in my isolation on some options uh, for myself and maybe proposals, larger proposals, but 
it's too early for me to say anything about it. But uh, I just feel that this democratic process, uh, among, um, kind of uh, process of uh, emancipation, will be much more advanced and will not stop because there is no way to simply fix anything here. Uh, the our horizon, of course, is that there will be no uh, social divisions, there will be no racial divisions, there will be equality and participation and contribution of everybody to democratic process and to making change in every field. So I guess I share, this is not an original statement, I share this hope with lots of people. Uh, and so I feel that uh, also artists uh, will, ha will have an opportunity to contribute uh, in all kinds of ways. One important thing is to find a form for our doubts and complexities and even hypocrisies and uncover, uh, reveal, uh, just be honest and confront all of those things that were suppressed and hidden. I'm talking about, of course, us, white part of, uh, of, uh, of the population, but we should join discursive future exchange of points of view, working together, not in unison, but in some healthy, uh, dynamic, discursive way, whether we are black or white or any color. So that's my uh, hope, my vision, my horizon, I guess, to which we should be, uh, we should be moving uh, uh, beyond the present moment. Uh, which of course is extremely inspirational and uh, it is giving a burst to all kinds of ideas to move on. Well, thank you very much for speaking with me today. I hope that uh,